carbohydrates. And the first job I ever had working in a lab, I was working for a, a guy who was an expert in carbohydrates. So I learned a little bit there. Anyhow, and probably learned even more studying biochemistry. Anyhow, so carbohydrates. And we're going to talk about um, a lot of different things that deal with carbohydrates. But where do carbohydrates come from? Well, if you think about carbohydrates that are in things like potatoes or grains and breads and sugar, right, that comes from sugar cane, well, they're synthesized by photosynthesis where plants take carbon dioxide and water and they put them together and this equation is not balanced but they end up making a sugar now this is glucose here and that's a very simplified formula but that's the idea that's what photosynthesis is it's taking carbon dioxide and water and putting them together to make a glucose and glucose is a major energy source for human beings right i know that i eat too much glucose it says here that one gram of carbohydrate or one gram of sugars gives you about four kilocalories of energy per gram. So that's a total of four kilocalories in one gram for a digested carbohydrate. It says here that complex carbohydrates like starches, and those are the ones that are found in things like potatoes are the best for your diet. And of course, the USDA recommends that only about half of your daily calories come from carbohydrates. So when you hear me say the word sugars, okay, sugars, I don't necessarily always mean table sugar. Table sugar is um, sucrose, which is one type of carbohydrate, but sugars is sort of a, uh, another way that we can use to describe carbohydrates, which are nothing more than really polyhydroxy aldehydes and ketones, and I'll go into that in more detail. Anyhow, the types of carbohydrates that you have to be aware of, we have what are called monosaccharides, disaccharides, oligosaccharides, and polysaccharides. And you can see that I highlighted these prefixes, mono meaning one. So if we have one sugar, examples of monosaccharides would be things like glucose, um, fructose, other sugars you probably haven't heard of like mannose, okay? Um, galactose would be another, galactose is another. And I don't expect you to memorize all of the possible monosaccharides out there. There are many different monosaccharides, but you're going to see them, so you should be aware of what a monosaccharide is. A disaccharide, as you can imagine, is when we put two monosaccharides together and we make um, this new molecule that we call a disaccharide. For example, sucrose, right, which is table sugar, is made from two monosaccharides. Sucrose is, in fact, made from glucose, glucose, and fructose which are put together in what's called a glycosidic bond. And I'll tell you what that is later on. You've probably all heard of lactose. You, and I'm sure you all know somebody who is lactose intolerant. Um, lactose is a disaccharide that's made from glucose and galactose. So you could write that down. So glucose, glucose plus galactose. And you'll be expected to know these, but we'll look at these disaccharides in more detail later on. And again, I kind of mentioned this word in passing that the bond that links two monosaccharides together, we call that a glycosidic bond. It's just a special name that we give to the bond, right? Organic chemists love to give special names to, to things. Next, we can have an oligosaccharide. That is anything that is three to 10 monosaccharides long. So anywhere between three and 10 uh, monosaccharides linked together by those glycosidic bonds, we form an oligosaccharide. And polysaccharides, right? You've seen the word poly in chemistry before, like a polymer, right? If you think of a polymer, it would be something like, you know, um, we think about things like nylon, for example, is a polymer, or um, lexan is a polymer, or something like Kevlar, which is found in bulletproof vests, or, you know, canoes sometimes are made out of Kevlar. Well, a polysaccharide is a polymer. However, it's a naturally occurring polymer. And some examples would be things like starches, right, which we already mentioned on the first slide. Um, glycogen, which is the principal storage form of glucose in our bodies. And then cellulose, which is a polymer, um, um, a sugar polymer that makes up the walls of plants, things like that. Anyhow, yes, polysaccharides are also linked by glycosidic bonds. But that's kind of a generalization because we can have other bonds besides poly, uh, besides 
um, glycosidic bonds in polysaccharides. But yes, most of the bonds I would say would be glycosidic bonds. And we'll look at exactly what a glycosidic bond is later on. Well, I can see that my scribbles didn't get deleted. I tried to delete them uh, before I downloaded this. Anyhow, there we go. Well, monosaccharides are made out of, generally speaking, three elements. So we have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And they have this generic formula here, CH2, CH2O, um, N, where N could be any integer from three to seven. So that's where the word carbohydrate comes from, because we have, for every carbon atom, we have a molecule of water. So carbo comes from here, and then hydrate comes from this part here. Now, again, I would say most, most monosaccharides are simply composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but they can also have other elements in, in them, okay? So we can have many different um, carbohydrates that contain nitrogen or phosphorus. We can even have sulfur in different carbohydrates, right? Sulfur wouldn't be that uncommon. I'm trying to think of some other ones. I was thinking of tin, but that's not naturally occurring. It's just sometimes used in some reactions. So I'll delete the, I'll delete the tin. Tin is definitely not natural to a carbohydrate. Anyhow, there we go. Well, what if we want to name a monosaccharide? How would we go about naming a monosaccharide? So I'll delete some of this here. And the way that we go about naming a monosaccharide is that we look at the functional group that's at the top of the carbohydrate. So if you're wondering, like, what's the top of the carbohydrate, Mr. Dion? Well, carbohydrates, when they're drawn as Fischer projections, and these two molecules here, these are Fischer projections. You might remember that I think I might have shown you these earlier on where you have, you know, lines like this. That's a Fischer projection. Anyhow, um, if you have an aldehyde at the top of your carbohydrate molecule, that is what we call an aldose. So an aldose is when we have an aldehyde at the top. And when you have a ketone functional group at the top, like we do right here, and in fact, the circle, the ketone, I should identify these carbons too, then that is what we call a ketose. So a ketose and an aldose. So again, we look at the functional group at the top. If it's an aldehyde, it's an aldose. If it's a ketone, it's a ketose. After that, we count up the total number of carbons in the molecule. Now, when it says here the main skeleton, for this class, the main skeleton is simply going to mean the molecule. So you count up all the carbons in the molecule. If there's three, you call it a triose. If it's four, it's called a tetros. So tri meaning three, tetra meaning four. If it's five, it's a pentose. And if it's got six carbons, it's a hexose. And so if we look at, let's say, this carbohydrate here, we can say that this is an aldose because it has an aldehyde functional group at the top. But we can also say that this is a triose because it's got one, two, three carbons. Now we can combine those two, aldose and triose, together to give ourselves even more information from a name. And if we mix together aldose and triose, we get an aldotriose. Okay, so an aldotriose denotes that it's an aldose and a triose. If we look at the next molecule, Okay, you can see that this is D-glucose, a much bigger molecule. It's got double the amount of carbons. But again, it's an aldose because it's got an aldehyde at the top. How many total carbons does it have? Let's count them. Starting from the top, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is a hexose. We put them together and we get aldohexose. And then finally, on the far right-hand side, it's kind of hard to see here, but hopefully you can see that the functional group in the Ketose that's on the far right, um, or the functional group in the molecule on the far right is a ketone. So this is a ketose, and the molecule has a total of six carbons, and so it becomes a ketohexose. So a ketohexose, and these are all very common sugars, D-glyceraldehyde, D-glucose, and D-fructose. And if you're wondering, you know, I've never seen an organic molecule before that had to have a letter of the alphabet in front of it. What's the significance of the D? Well, I'm going to explain what the significance of the letter D is to you um, soon enough. And that is kind of our segue into stereoisomer and stereochemistry. And in fact, the first thing I asked you before we uh, 
logged on this evening or before we started recording this, I showed you two molecules that were mirror images of one another. And I said, are these molecules the same? Now, if I try to draw the models that I showed you, if you're watching this video after class or something, I had a molecule or I had um, a carbon with, let's say, a bond to a yellow sphere. Then I had a bond like this, and we'll say that that is a red sphere like that. Then we have a bond going in the back. We have one coming out in front. We have one going in back here, and we have one coming out in front. So let's say this one has a blue atom on it, and then this one has a green atom on it. And you can see that there is a mirror plane between these two molecules. They're reflections of one another. But the question that I asked you was, are these two molecules the same? And drawing these in an iPad is a great way to demonstrate that these two molecules are, in fact, not identical. Okay? These are non-identical molecules. Watch, if I select one of them using the select tool, and then I try to place it on top of the others, you can see that it doesn't line up exactly the same. Okay? So these are two different molecules. It works better with handheld models, but it's a it will su suffice for a demonstration. And so these molecules are not, not identical, okay? And we're gonna explore that even more. And so that brings us to the, the prefix D. You saw D-glucose, D-fructose, D-glyceraldehyde on the last slide. Well, what you're gonna see is that there's also such thing as L-glyceraldehyde and L-glucose and L-fructose. And you might be wondering, what's the significance of the D and the L? Well, the D and the L are used to differentiate between two isomeric forms. Now, what's, what kind of isomers are these? Because we've talked about different types of isomers in this class. For example, let's say I gave you the formula C2H6O. We've discussed this at length. We could make this compound dimethyl ether, or we could make ethanol. These compound, oops. These compounds are structural isomers, right? They are not connected in the same way, obviously, because this one has an oxygen between two carbons and this one is an alcohol. So those are structural isomers. But now you can see that these two molecules have the same structure, right? They're, the carbon in the center is connected to the exact same types of groups. How do they differ? They differ in the arrangement of atoms in space. And therefore, we describe them as being stereoisomers of one another. Again, they have the same connectivity. However, they have a different spatial arrangement of atoms. Now, that might not be completely intuitive to you, but I promise you, if it's something that you um, spend enough time looking at, and handheld models, again, are really useful for this, you can definitely um, clarify in your mind that these two molecules are non identical. And that's what stereoisomers are. They're non-superimposable, or sorry, if we look at the stereoisomers of D and L glyceraldehyde, which we will in a second, we actually see that they are non-superimposable mirror images. And the definition, and this is a definition that you need to know, of non-superimposable mirror image molecules, we call those enantiomers, kind of a fancy word. And so these two molecules that I drew up here, they're non-superimposable mirror images, and so these are enantiomers, enantiomers. And there are several examples of enantiomers in our everyday life. Here's the definition shown right here. Enantiomers are simply non-superimposable mirror images. And here's an example of an enantiomer that you would find in your everyday life, your two hands, right? If you put your hands next to one another, if you hold them out with the thumbs facing each other, you see that your two hands are mirror images, but they are non-superimposable. If you try to lay one on top of the other, I just did that. I see that my right hand has a thumb pointing to the left, and my left hand has a thumb pointing to the right. So even though they're mirror, mirror images, they are non-superimposable. They are enantiomers. And so we are familiar with the concept of enantiomers in our everyday life. Again, if you were to try to overlap the two molecules that are drawn on this slide, if you're to take this one and try to superimpose it on top of the other one, what you would see is that the red and the green spheres would overlap, but the yellow would end up here and the purple would end up over here. And so they wouldn't overlap, okay? Non-superimposable mirror images. Again, 
Those are what we call enantiomers, a definition that's really important for us in this class. So next, I want to discuss with you what chirality is. It says that a carbon atom that has four different groups bonded to it is called a chiral carbon atom. Notice that it says four different groups, not necessarily four different atoms. There are a lot of examples that we could use where we have four different atoms bonded to a carbon, but we have to have four different groups. Any molecule that has a chiral carbon can exist as a pair of enantiomers. It says here that chirality and glyceraldehyde, which is the simplest carbohydrate there is, and that's what's shown right here. This is actually D glyceraldehyde. Glycerol. You can go back and fact check me a couple of slides back because we had the structure. Okay, it's got one chiral carbon. And larger carbohydrates can often have much more than one chiral carbon. For example, cholesterol has eight car chiral carbons in it. If we look at this molecule that I had drawn ahead of time here, what would render this carbon a chiral carbon? The reason that carbon that I have the red star next to is chiral is because it is attached to four different groups. Let me show you. The chlorine counts as a group. The fluorine counts as a group. The iodine counts as a group, and then here I have a methyl. So chlorine, fluorine, iodine, and a methyl, those are all different groups, and therefore that carbon is chiral. If we look at the molecule of D-glyceraldehyde that I have drawn on here, you can see that I even went ahead and highlighted the groups around the chiral carbon. So this is, oops, this is the chiral carbon right here. I'll put another red star by it, like this. Okay, remember, it's not four different atoms, it's four different groups. So the aldehyde would be considered a group, this hydrogen is a group, this oxygen is a group, and this CH2OH is also a group, so four different groups. And so that carbon has one, or that uh, molecule has one chiral carbon in it. I just want to point out the other carbons in the molecule. Somebody might be asking, well, there's two other carbons in this molecule, right? There's a carbon right here. Okay, maybe I'll circle it in a different color. We have this carbon here. The reason that is not a chiral carbon, the one with the carbonyl on it, is because it is not attached to four different groups, is it? It's only attached to three groups, the oxygen, the hydrogen, and all of this here. Also, you might be wondering about the other carbon, right? There's another carbon here. Well, if you have, any time that you have a CH2, which is a methylene, or a methyl, these are not chiral. They can never be chiral carbons. Why? Because if the carbon already has two hydrogens attached to it, it's impossible for it to have four different groups. If the carbon in a methyl group already has three hydrogens, it's impossible for it to be attached to four different groups. So anytime you see a CH2, a methylene, or a CH3, a methyl, you know right away that carbon is not chiral. You can just ignore it and say that is not a chiral carbon. Now, going back to this larger bio, biological molecules thing here, if we go back to a molecule like D-glucose that I have in this yellow box here, and I'm not gonna go over this in gross detail right now, but if you look at all of the carbons in the molecule, okay, you see that we have a chiral carbon here, 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 and here. These two carbons that I'm highlighting in green are not chiral for the reasons that I just explained, but the other four carbons in yellow, they are all chiral carbons. Now, if, you don't, if you're not 100% sure, if you're like, I'm not sure on, about that, Mr. Dion, we'll take a look at those carbons in more detail later to be 100% sure that they are chiral carbons. So chirality, you need to know what chirality is. You need to know what produces a chiral carbon, a carbon attached to four different groups, and you need to know what enantiomers are, non-superimposable mirror images. Let's take a look at that simplest carbohydrate a little bit more. Glyceraldehyde. It is literally the simplest carbohydrate you can have. There is no simpler carbohydrate than glyceraldehyde. You see the structure of glyceraldehyde shown at the bottom, shown in its two enantiomeric forms. Enantiomeric just means two and two different enantiomers. Again, we have the two, we have the one chiral carbon in D glyceraldehyde, 
and we have the one chiral carbon in L glyceraldehyde. We discussed already why those carbons are chiral, right? We'll just go with this one here first. It's attached to one, two, three, four different groups, so it's chiral. The same reason the chiral carbon in L glyceraldehyde is chiral. What's the difference? The difference is this. In the D isomer, the hydroxyl on the stereo center is on the right. So the hydroxyl is on the right hand side. In L glycerol, sorry, yes, in L glyceraldehyde, the hydroxyl at the stereo center is on the left. So we have our L glyceraldehyde, oops, with our chiral center right here. And you can see that the hydroxyl is on the left hand side. So that's how they differ. Again, you can see that there's a mirror plane between these two, right? These are mirror images of each other, but they're non superimposable mirror images, aren't they? So, a definition that you need to be fully aware of in this class is that the D isomer has the hydroxyl on the uh, stereo center on the right, and the L isomer of, D, of uh, glyceraldehyde as the hydroxyl on the stereo center on the left. Well, that's all well and good for a molecule like glyceraldehyde that has only one chiral carbon. But you remember a couple of minutes ago, I showed you glucose and I said, well, look, glucose had four chiral carbons. So which one is it that decides whether the molecule is D or L? Well, we'll look at that in a second. But first, let's take a look at these models right here. Again, I have shown in the top left that a methylene, a CH2, or a methyl, a CH3, can never be a chiral carbon. And these are nothing more than ball and stick models of D and L glyceraldehyde. That's all that's being shown here. This is the OH, the hydroxyl here, and this is the other hydroxyl on D and L glyceraldehyde, respectively. Okay, so you can see how there's a mirror plane running down between these two mirror images, these two enantiomers. You can also see why this carbon, or these carbons here, are achiral. They're not chiral. It's because they're both attached to two hydrogens, which are identical. Anyhow, there we go. That's nothing more than a ball and stick model. And this is one of those topics, again, where handheld models can come in really handy for a student who is learning the content. Well, if enantiomers have the same connectivity, what's interesting about enantiomers is that enantiomers have the same boiling point, they're going to have the same melting point, they're going to have the same densities, they're going to have the same what's called a refractive index. I know that's a topic that we haven't learned yet, but they're going to have all the same physical properties, right? Why would they have the same physical properties? The reason why is because physical properties are based on the ability of a molecule to pack together. And if I, whether I have this stereoisomer, or if I have this stereoisomer, they're going to pack the exact same way once you have multiple of that molecule. Okay, so all I'm saying is if you have a bunch of these all packed together, they're going to pack just as efficiently as if I have a bunch of these. And that is why enantiomers have all the same physical properties. And so you might be wondering, well, how could I distinguish between two enantiomers? I can't shrink myself down to the size of a molecule and go, and investigate, you know, what's what's going on? Who's pointing to the right hand side? Who's pointing to the left hand side? Well, there is a way that we can distinguish between enantiomers, and that is to use or take advantage of the property that's called optical activity. So that will be a new concept to most of you. It says here that enantiomers, non superimposable mirror images, are going to interact with plane polarized light so that they rotate the plane polarized light in opposite directions. And I'm going to add to that here. It should say plane of light in equal, in equal, but opposite directions. And we call that optical activity. Optical activity, again, is the only way that we have to just, not the only way, but it's one of the best ways that we have to distinguish between enantiomers. And the device that we use to measure optical activity is called a polarimeter. Now, what is a polarimeter and how does it work? Well, 
we have to talk about light a little bit first. Okay, I know that some of you might be physics students and you know discuss electromagnetic radiation at length, but I know that all of you took chemistry 101 or introductory chemistry at some point and would have looked at the properties of light. And so I have shown a light bulb here, and we know that when you turn a light bulb on, that the light travels in all directions. And so light has a magnetic field component, excuse me, and an electric field component. But what you need to understand is that the light, normal light, vibrates in an infinite number of directions perpendicular to the direction of travel, okay? Now, if you're like, I'm not sure what that means, that sounds pretty, um, that sounds kind of complicated. All it means is that the wavelengths or the waves of light are going off in all directions. And what we can do is we can pass normal light through what's called a polarizing filter. If any of you have ever seen polarized sunglasses before, I think I asked you this in the lab or I asked one of the groups about it if they'd ever seen polarized sunglasses. Um, one of my students, I think, alluded to the fact that Oakley's are polarized sunglasses and they come with a little polarizing filter on the hag tag so that you can prove to yourself that they're polarized sunglasses. Well, what happens is when you pass light through a polarizing filter, instead of getting all the oscillations of light that are perpendicular to the direction of travel, only the light that's vibrating in the plane of the filter is going to come through on the other side. So basically you're filtering out all the light except the light that is vibrating in one specific direction. Okay. So then once you have that light that's shining in one specific direction, you shine it through a solution of your compound, whether it's the D glyceraldehyde, for example, or the L glyceraldehyde. And what's going to happen is, depending on which enantiomer you have, it's going to rotate the plane polarized light to the same amount, by the same amount, in one direction or another. If you're still unsure, well, a picture is worth a thousand words, isn't it? And this is just a little schematic of a polarimeter that comes from our textbook. Again, here we have the light bulb, okay? And we have the light shining in all directions. Now, normally when we use a polarimeter, we only use one wavelength of light, and that comes from the D line of sodium, which is beyond the scope of our class, but it's basically comes from a sodium lamp that has a wavelength of 589 nanometers. You do not need to know that, but just in case you have an inquiring mind, Anyhow, the idea is you got your monochromatic light, right? The light is oscillating in all directions. And that's what's being represented here. Now, you might be splitting hairs and saying, well, Mr. Dion, it looks like it's only going in eight different directions there. Well, technically, it's going in an infinite number of directions. But here's that polarizing filter. After you've passed the light through the polarizing filter, look, now we have only one direction of light. And so inside our sample tube, we have our chiral compound. So we have our compound in solution. So our compound is in solution there. And what happens is the plane polarized light actually interacts with the molecules in solution. And when the light bounces off of the compound that, or the compound that's in solution, the compound actually causes that light to bend or rotate in one direction. So you can see how it's rotating maybe to this side here, right? It looks like it's rotating to the left. And then you measure this angle in degrees, okay? Now, what you need to know is if you have one enantiomer, let's say you have enantiomer A, and let's say it rotated plane polarized light in 10 degrees in a positive direction, okay? And positive is the same thing as going clockwise. If you have enantiomer B, it's going to rotate plane polarized light negative 10 degrees, oops, which is counterclockwise. So it rotated it the same amount, but in an opposite direction. So enantiomers rotate plane polarized light in the same amount, in an equal amount, but in opposite directions. Okay, there we go. So this is the summary of what's going on here. And um, so follow along with me here taking the time to summarize this all here. So here we go. It says, when you take an enantiomer, you put it in a solution, you put it in the polar polarimeter, and you shine plain polarized light towards it. One enantiomer is always going to rotate it in a clockwise or positive direction. We call this the dextrorotatory isomer. That's where the letter D comes from. 
The other one is going to rotate it in a counterclockwise direction. That's where the letter L comes from, and L stands for levorotatory. Under the same conditions, enantiomers are always going to rotate plane polarized light exactly the same amount, but in opposite directions. Again, like I told you, if you have an enantiomer A and B, if A rotates it, let's say, we could even do the other way. If it rotates at negative 25 degrees, well, then B is going to rotate it positive 25 degrees, like that. And so that's really one of the only ways, and there are, there are a few others, that, but this is probably the most commonly used way to differentiate between enantiomers. Okay, well, let's switch gears a little bit here and talk about what's called the Fisher projection formula. Right, we've looked at all different kinds of formulas in this class, condensed formulas, right, Lewis structures, molecular formulas. Um, we've looked at Haworth projections in this class. We looked at chair, the, the chair of cyclohexane. And yeah, a Fisher projection um, uses lines crossing through a chiral carbon to represent bonds. So let's say you had this molecule right here and you wanted to represent that with a Fisher projection. You can see that these two bonds here are coming towards you. And so these would technically be on wedges like this. And you can also see that these two bonds here are going behind or going back away from you. And so we would draw these bonds on dashes like that. But to simplify, instead of drawing a plethora of dashes and wedges, we simply just draw a cross like that. And we know that the bonds that are horizontal are coming out of the page. And we know that the bonds that are vertical are going back into the page. Okay? So that's what a Fisher projection is. And what's also cool about Fisher projections is it provides you an easier way to compare stereoisomers. If you don't believe me, well, we'll look at some examples of that. Now, Fisher projections were invented by Emil Fisher. And if you're wondering, or if you're frustrated and saying, oh boy, just another thing to learn in organic chemistry, another way to represent molecules. Well, the reason why Fisher developed the Fisher projection was to actually save time. When we look at bigger um, carbohydrates like glucose or fructose, they have multiple stereocenters. It actually becomes a lot easier to keep track of them using Fisher projections. Anyhow, we'll see examples of that. Here are the Fisher projections of glyceraldehyde, glucose, and fructose that are shown here. You don't have to memorize these. They'll probably come up so much in our, um, in our, uh, in our discussions on carbohydrates that you might get used to the glucose molecule. But again, here are some Fisher projections of monosaccharides. If we look at deglyceraldehyde, we know that deglyceraldehyde has just that one chiral carbon, this one here. The hydroxyl is pointing to the right-hand side, and that's why we call it a D carbohydrate, right? You could get some practice drawing L-glyceraldehyde if you wanted to. All you'd have to do is draw the cross like this. You have your aldehyde up here. You have your alcohol group down here, but your hydrogen would be on this side, and the hydroxyl would be on this side. And so this would be L-glyceraldehyde, glyceraldehyde, like that. So D and L-glyceraldehyde. Again, nothing more than non-superimposable mirror images. Again, in the L molecule, the hydroxyl is pointing to the left. Now let's take a look at glucose and fructose. These are more interesting molecules than deglyceraldehyde because they have more stereocenters. In fact, if you look at D-glucose, it has a stereocenter here. I'll highlight them in blue. We have one here, 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 and here. Now we've already discussed why this carbon isn't a stereocenter and why this carbon is a, isn't a stereocenter. But let me just go over a couple of these carbons with you and prove to you that they are stereocenters. Sometimes students will struggle with this. Let's look at carbon two first and decide that that is a stereocenter. If we look at carbon two, I'll draw it in here, you can see that it's attached to a hydrogen, a hydroxyl group, an aldehyde up here, and all of this down here, right? You would hopefully agree with me that what's in these four black circles are all different from each other. Right? These are all very different groups. Again, it's not four different atoms, it's four different groups. Yes, I'm fully aware that there's a carbon here and a carbon here, but that's not the deciding factor. It's that that carbon is attached to four different groups. 
And you can do the exact same exercise with this carbon, this carbon, and this carbon. So in D-glucose, there is a total of four stereocenters. Now let's address the whole concept of D-glucose. And you probably guessed what the answer is, right? Because you see that there's three hydroxyls that are highlighted in pink. So the answer is this. If you have a D carbohydrate, a D sugar, like D glyceraldehyde, D glucose, or D fructose, well, in D glyceraldehyde, there's only one chiral center. The hydroxyl is pointing to the right hand side, so it's D. But with D glucose and D fructose, what we do is we start numbering the carbons going from the top of the Fisher projection and we go downward. The last chiral carbon, okay, if we look at the last chiral carbon, the last chiral carbon on glucose is carbon number five, and the last chiral carbon on D-fructose is also carbon number five. And you see that on the last chiral carbon of each of these molecules that the hydroxyl is pointing on the right-hand side. That is what renders them D-glucose and D-fructose. Yes, I'm fully aware that both of them have hydroxyls that are pointing to, did I say the left, uh, the left-hand side? But that is not what signifies whether the molecule is D or L. So again, the hydroxyl on the last chiral carbon, if it's pointing to the right-hand side on that last chiral carbon, that results in a D sugar, a D monosaccharide. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on D and L sugars. All right, thanks, Gavin. Great, good, yeah. It's just a concept that everybody needs to know, the difference between a D and an L sugar. Something else that I'll just throw out here, and I mean, sugar is the kind of concept that I could, or the kind of topic that I could talk to you a lot about. But something that I'll just put out there and throw out there to you is that the reason, if you're wondering, like, why are you talking a lot more about D sugars than L sugars? This is really the only one. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. This is really the only one that we've seen is L glyceraldehyde. What's so important about the D sugars? Well, the reason why is that D-carbohydrates, uh, D so I'll call them D-carbohydrates, are natural, okay? These are naturally occurring, naturally occurring. Whereas L-carbohydrates, they are not naturally occurring. These are synthetic, okay? Are there examples of naturally occurring L-carbohydrates? Yes, but not nearly as many as D-carbohydrates. Okay, so normally L sugars are produced in the lab. All right. Anyhow, let's talk a little bit more about compounds with chiral centers. I'm going to delete some of my scribbles here that didn't delete on the way. There we go. And there we go like that. Well, I'll leave my meso compound there. Anyhow, so here's some more terminology that you need to know, right? Whenever you learn something new in science, there's always some terminology that goes along with any new topic and tonight we're talking about stereochemistry carbohydrates okay i told you what enantiomers were enantiomers were non-superimposable mirror images well what if i have a 50 50 mixture of non-superimposable mirror images what do i call that i call it a racemic mixture so by definition a racemic mixture is just when i have an equal amount of two enantiomers Okay, so we say that a racemic mixture, we sometimes call it a racemate, and we sometimes just simply say it's optically inactive. Now, why would it be optically inactive? Because if I have a mixture of, let's say, enantiomer A and enantiomer B, okay, and if this enantiomer A rotates plane polarized light, let's say positive 12 degrees, and an enantiomer B is going to rotate at negative 12 degrees. If I have a 50 50 mixture of an enantiomer A and an enantiomer B, an enantiomer B, these two are going to cancel each other out, and I'm going to end up with zero degrees, right? So they are not going to rotate plane polarized light. Yes, both of the enantiomers are rotating plane polarized light, but when I have the racemic mixture, they cancel out, and I end up with a total optical rotation of zero degrees. All right, next, diastereomers. Diastereomers are stereoisomers that are not enantiomers. Okay, they're going to be some kind of stereoisomer 
um, that are not non-superimposable mirror images of each other. So they're not mirror images, but they are stereoisomers of one another. That's a definition that doesn't come up a lot in this class, but it would be worth, I'd say, the value of maybe one multiple choice question on your next exam. And the last one on this slide that you need to be aware of, the last definition that comes up a lot in organic chemistry is what's called a meso compound. Now a meso compound, and I have one drawn right down here in the bottom left, this is a meso compound, is a compound that's got two or more, maybe more chiral carbons, but it's got an internal plane of symmetry that causes it to be optically inactive. So if you look at this molecule here, maybe I'll bring it somewhere up here so it's a little easier to see, but if you look at this molecule right here, there are two stereocenters in this molecule, the one that I have highlighted in red and the one that I have highlighted in blue. If you're not 100% sure, you could pause the video or draw the molecule and see that this carbon that I have the red star attached to is attached to this hydrogen, this hydroxyl, and you can clearly see that this carbon is different than this one, so it is attached to four different groups. But since there are two chiral centers in here and I have a plane of symmetry running through the molecule, let's say if this one rotates plane polarized light positive 50 degrees, this one would rotate it negative 50 degrees and they cancel each other out. And so you end up with something that is optically inactive, right? It's not going to rotate plane polarized light, a meso compound. Okay, so again, I wouldn't expect you to remember this after hearing me say it for the first time, but you need to know the definition of a racemic mixture, diastereomers, and a meso compound. You need to know that a racemic mixture is an equal para, equal amounts of an enantiomers, so it produces an optically active mixture. And then a meso compound, even though the compound does have chiral centers, there's a mirror plane or an internal plane of symmetry which causes over the molecule to be overall optically inactive. All right, let's get back to that DNL system that we talked about a little bit before. I told you that DNL, that D is the most common form. It says here most common sugars are in the D form. L sugars are usually produced in the lab. There are naturally occurring L sugars, but not nearly as many of them. I've also told you that Fisher projections are always drawn such that the most oxidized carbon is closest to the top, and then we number it going from the top to the bottom. If you're wondering, like, what do you mean by most oxidized carbon, okay? That means that either the aldehyde group or the ketone group is going to be at the top, okay? The chiral carbon with the highest number, if the hydroxyl is on the right, it's D. If the hydroxyl is on the left, it's L, all right? And again, most natural sugars are going to be in the D form. Here's the structure of deglyceraldehyde shown with dashes and wedges. This is a much cleaner structure, isn't it? A Fischer projection. And we see the same thing for L-glyceraldehyde. Look, here's our chiral carbon. Our hydroxyl is pointing to the left-hand side, which renders it L. And then you see the much tidier and cleaner Fischer projection. All right, Fischer projections are a great tool. All right, well, let's talk about some of the important carbohydrates that you need to be aware of. Okay, there's a few of them that are going to come up over and over and over. In fact, I know that some of you have already taken biology at the college level, and I'm sure that you talked about glucose in lots of detail, right? When you study things like glycolysis and uh, the Krebs cycle, I'm sure you talked about glucose in that uh, when discussing those subjects. All right. Well, glucose, oftentimes we see it written out as C6H12O6 because that is the molecular formula of glucose. However, I want you to be aware of the fact that glucose is not the only molecule, it's not the only carbohydrate that has this formula, okay? There are many carbohydrates that have that same formula. What would they be? They would be stereo, stereoisomers of one another. Anyhow, the reason why glucose comes up so much in chemistry and biology is because it is the most important sugar for human beings. We find glucose in a lot of different foods, um, it also has other names. If you've ever heard of somebody say, um, somebody say my blood sugar is low or I have too high blood sugar. Well, when we talk about blood sugar, we're actually talking about glucose. Sometimes you might look at packaging and see the word dextrose on it. Dextrose also is the same thing as glucose. And um, we regulate the concentration of um, glucose 
in our blood by insulin and glucagon. So if you know somebody who's diabetic, they might have an insulin pump uh, for, per se. Maybe before they're going to eat a big meal, they'll give themselves a shot of insulin. And we'll talk about insulin and glucagon later on in the class and discuss what their effects are and um, uh, just go, go into more detail about their effects on um, carbohydrates. Anyhow, here comes the dreaded hemiacetal, right? It's back again. It says here that under physiological conditions, so that would be a pH of around 7.4 in room temperature or body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius, glucose is going to exist as a cyclic hemiacetal where the C5-hydroxyl reacts with the C1 carbonyl. Oy. Okay, well, we're going to look at that in detail. And we could end up with two possible isomers depending on whether the hydroxyl at carbon 5, um, or depending on how it reacts with the, um, uh, with the carbonyl at carbon 1. Okay, so the hemiacetal, you should remember that functional group. Right, when we have a carbon with one ether on it and one hydroxyl on it, that is a hemiacetal. And so we're going to see hemiacetals come up again and again in this class. So here you go. Here's the cyclic form of glucose. I'm going to erase my scribbles first so that you can get the hang of what's going on here. And we're going to take a look at how we go from this Fischer projection right here, okay? So this is the open chain form of glucose. This is called a Fischer, Fischer projection. And then we have these cyclic structures here. So you might be wondering, what is going on in the slide, Mr. Dion? I thought this was supposed to be just glucose. Well, glucose actually exists in an equilibrium. Remember these arrows? Those aren't resonance arrows. That's an equilibrium arrow. You might not have, you, you might not remember those as much, uh, but equilibrium arrows. So that means that some of the time glucose is in this open chain form, which just means it's like a long chain. And then sometimes it exists in these cyclic forms here. So if you go back to the last slide, and I'm not going to do it, but it said that the hydroxyl on carbon five, that would be this hydroxyl, can react with the carbon of the aldehyde to produce a cyclic hemiacetal. So what happens is, even though it looks like this carbon and this hydroxyl are pretty far apart, if you draw the molecule like this, which is more based in reality because we know these bonds aren't all flat, you can see that the hydroxyl on carbon five, right here, is actually not all that far away from the carbonyl carbon, right? Carbon one. You see that they're pretty close to one another. So what happens is, the lone pair, one of the lone pairs on the oxygen of the hydroxyl can actually form a bond to that carbon like this, okay? And then this oxygen here will end up taking this hydrogen from the hydroxyl group to produce two different cyclic hemiacetals. Now, if you're wondering, where's my hemiacetal? Remember, a hemiacetal is when we have a carbon with two R groups attached. It's going to have an ether on one side, and it's going to have a hydroxyl on the other. If you look at these two cyclic forms of glucose here, we call one alpha beta or alpha deglucose, and the other one beta deglucose. What's the difference? Well, if you look at carbons two, three, four, and five, and six, you'll actually see there's no difference between any of those carbons that I just highlighted in green. But there is a difference between the two carbons labeled carbon number one, isn't there? If you look at carbon number one here, first of all, let's be sure that it's a hemiacetal. Let's draw the carbon in. You can see that the carbon has an ether, carbon, oxygen, carbon here, and it also has an alcohol attached to it. We see the same thing for beta D glucose, right? Here's our carbon. It has an ether attached to it, and it also has an alcohol attached to it. So now that we've clarified that carbon number one in the closed form, which is what these are called, the closed form, now that we know that carbon number one is a hemiacetal, what differentiates the two? Well, you see that in the first one, alpha-D glucose, that the hydroxyl on carbon number one is pointing down 
and you see that the hydroxyl on carbon number one of the, of the beta is pointing up. And that is the difference right there. On alpha D glucose, the hydroxyl at carbon number one is pointing down. And in beta D glucose, the hydroxyl at carbon number one is pointing up. An easy way to remember this, which was taught to me by my students, is that alpha looks like a fish. Like that, there's my fish, okay. And fish live in the ocean, which is down. And my students taught me that beta looks like a butterfly and butterflies live up in the air. So that might be a handy way to remember that alpha and beta. Alpha is when the hydroxyl is pointing down at carbon number one. And beta is when the hydroxyl is pointing up at carbon number one. Well, you have all been studying organic chemistry long enough to know that we couldn't just get away with calling the first carbon carbon number one, could we? No, organic chemists have to give it a fancy name. So this carbon number one, on the cyclic form, we call that the anomeric carbon. So anomeric carbon. All right, and we're going to take a look at that in a second. But before we do that, I want to show you how to draw the closed form of a carbohydrate, starting with the open form of a carbohydrate. And I have a really quick, quick way to do it. And I'll show it to you right after the break. OK, so why don't we take a quick break? And I'm not there yet. And what I'm going to do during that break is I'm going to show you how to go from any open chain carbohydrate, for example, D-glucose, and I'm going to show, show you my patented, well, not patented, my technique for drawing the closed form. Okay, so we'll do that after our break. 